Okay, now let's talk about DNA replication, the copying of DNA, which you'll recall happens during the <coughs> S phase of the cell cycle. Um, so, um, DNA has to start somewhere on the chromosome. I'm sorry, replication has to start somewhere on a chromosome with the DNA, and so that's known as the origin of replication. So that's kind of where things get started. And so a bacterial chromosome consists of, uh, they have a single circular chromosome, and eukaryotes have linear chromosomes, and they have multiple of them. But in either case, you'll have an origin of replication. You'll notice that what happens is, oh, and in eukaryotes, you'll have, excuse me, several origins of replication on a single chromosome. And you notice what happens is replication starts at one spot and then proceeds in both directions, <coughs> okay? And in bacteria, it'll proceed. It'll start one one spot and proceed around the chromosome until you two, made two copies. And the eukaryote will start in several spots and it'll proceed until you reach the end of the chromosome or until two they they run into each other. And so, who are the uh, who's involved with DNA replication? Where there are several, of course, obviously DNA is involved, but there are several enzymes involved. And let's look at these. All right, first, we have these things called topoisomerases, and these are enzymes that basically unwind the DNA. Remember, DNA is a double helix that's sort of wound up like a corkscrew, and so what it does is unwind it. It does this by making little breaks in the nucleotides, between the nucleotides and DNA, so that it can sort of straighten out and not be twisted up. Then you have helicase, which comes along and unzips the DNA. You have single-stranded binding proteins, that keep the DNA apart, keep it from sort of just sticking back together. <clears throat> now you also have primase, and primase, what it does is it adds a little piece of RNA primer that will be more than two, but several nucleotides long. And so what that does is by adding that primer, it tells the DNA polymerase where to go and start adding bases. <clears throat> DNA polymerase, in this case DNA polymerase 3, is what comes along, recognizes where the RNA primer is, and starts adding complementary bases along the um, strand that it's reading. The old strand, the dark blue one, the light one, the new one it's making. Helicase keeps going along and unzipping, and polymerase just follows behind, <clears throat> adding the new bases extending that copy of the DNA. All right, now you'll notice up here in our DNA, where our origin of replication is, we have um, um, this little fork here, and this is called the replication fork, and you'll notice on one side replication is occurring towards the replication fork, and on the other side, it goes away from the replication fork. Now, you might ask yourself, why is that? Why doesn't it just go towards it on both sides? Well, this is due to a peculiar nature of this DNA polymerase 3, and that is it can only build DNA in one direction. If you look here, here's our original molecule. Here's our 3 prime end, 3 to 5. On the complementary strand, 5 to 3. Well, DNA polymerase can only build 5 to 3, or you might say it can only read the old copy in the 3 to 5. So if on this side down here we're working this way, it would be building 3 to 5, and it can't do that. It can only build in the 5 to 3 direction. So we get what we call the, the leading strand, which is the side where it's building towards the replication fork and you get a lagging strand where it's building away from the replication fork. And so it has to work in the opposite direction. You have the same, <clears throat> same players involved, it's just going away from the replication fork. Now, this leads to something interesting though, in that what happens is, so some of the DNA is unzipped, the primase comes back, adds a primer, polymerase builds a piece, more of the DNA will be unzipped, the primase goes further back, adds a primer, polymerase comes and builds more, more of the DNA is unzipped, etc. So that on the 
lagging strand, it's essentially being built, the new copy is being built in pieces or fragments. And these fragments are known as Okazaki fragments. And so what happens is, again, you get these pieces built, and you'll notice you have a little piece of RNA that's sort of stuck in there where you, so here was one of our fragments, here's another of our fragments, etc. So what has to happen is you have to remove this RNA primer and replace it with DNA. And that's the job of a different polymerase molecule. I'm sorry, no, actually the same one, same polymerase 3 comes along. No, 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 it's a different one. This is a different polymerase that comes along, basically removes the RNA and replaces it with DNA. Okay. And then you have this enzyme called DNA ligase here, which bonds the, the new bases that have been added to the ones that were originally added on the strand. So basically, you've got the piece built, which has a piece of RNA. You have to remove the RNA with some polymerase, and the DNA ligase comes along and bonds those two Okazaki fragments together. So here's kind of the overall picture. We have leading strand, lagging strand, where we're again building it in these pieces. You unzip more of it, primase comes back, adds a primer, polymerase comes in, adds more bases, and you're just sort of doing leapfrog here, moving along the DNA as it's being unzipped with DNA polymerase replacing the RNA with DNA and then ligase bonding the Okazaki fragments together. <coughs> now sometimes mistakes are made in DNA replication and so what happens is there's a proofreading that goes on, nucleases remove the, the, the problematic bases, DNA polymerase comes in and replaces them and ligase bonds them together. So there is a repair mechanism that hopefully removes most or all mistakes. Now, okay, so there's another interesting phenomenon about DNA replication, and that is at the very ends of the chromosome, all right, the very ends of the chromosome, you'll have replication also starting there. It's not really shown here, but you have it happening. And so what happens is at the very end of the chromosome, you'll have a piece of RNA primer that's added. Notice here on this lagging strand, you end up with a piece of RNA at the end. Well, curiously enough, this mechanism here of removing the RNA and replacing it with DNA doesn't happen at the end of the chromosome. That is, the RNA is removed, but it's not replaced with DNA. So you'll notice towards the end, one of the pieces, one of the chromosomes, one of the pieces of DNA is actually a little longer than the new piece. All right, okay, that might not be that big a deal. But what happens when now we're going to take this piece of DNA and we're going to replicate it? We'll have this strand, which is one down here that's being used, and then we have this strand to make the copy. Well, what happens is now we end up with a piece of DNA or essentially a chromosome that is short on both ends. And imagine when we replicate it, we'll then be missing a piece here. And over time, as these chromosomes are replicated, they can get shorter and shorter. Well, these ends of chromosomes were known as telomeres. And essentially, as cells age, as DNA is replicated, these telomeres get shorter and shorter. Well, this is not a problem for the most part because the ends of chromosomes do not necessarily contain what we call coding DNA. That is, they do not contain genes. They contain extra, what we call sometimes this repetitive DNA. And so you might say they're not necessarily terribly important when it comes to the functioning of cells and organisms. But if that cell lives long enough, if that organism lives long enough, what can happen is the telomeres can come, be, get shorter and shorter and shorter until finally you start wearing away, if you will, at some of that important DNA, the coding DNA, the DNA that has genes in it. And that's thought to be part of the um, aging process. Now, in um, gametes, 
um, that you make in your reproductive organs, when it comes time to um, dealing with the DNA there, you have an enzyme called telomerase, which essentially builds up the telomere. So that is, it doesn't matter how old you are when you have kids, your kids will inherit chromosomes that have full length telomeres. But this enzyme only functions in your reproductive organs and the making or the replicating of DNA in those cells and the making of gametes. It doesn't happen in all your somatic cells, unfortunately. Section three, we have just enough time for that. So it's short, just deals with chromosomes and the structure of chromosomes. Of course, chromosomes are made of DNA, but they're more than DNA, they're DNA and proteins. You can see here these histone proteins. What these do is they get together, eight of them, and they form this little ball, if you will, and the DNA wraps around it. And these are known as nucleosomes. And so along the DNA, there'll be a bunch of these D nucleosomes, which again are the histones and the DNA wrapped around them. Well, what happens is then the nucleosomes will bunch together so that a piece of DNA that was, you know, this long is now only, say, this long. It has become shortened, if you will, by wrapping around these histones in these nucleosomes and bunching together. All right. So that makes what's known as this 30 nanometer fiber, which is again the DNA wrapped around the histones which have formed these structures called nucleosomes. All right. <clears throat> well then what happens is this fiber forms these loops. Okay. So essentially the red line I've drawn here is this fiber. And so that's sort of a further condensing of the DNA. And then what happens, and it's on this, what's called the scaffold protein, and so you'll have this, what are called these loop domains on this scaffolding protein, and then what happens is this whole structure also folds up, and at that point what you're seeing is the condensed chromosome, essentially a prophase chromosome. And so what this does is it takes essentially the relatively diffuse DNA that we would find in a cell that's not getting ready to divide, what we would call the chromatin, and take it up and bunch it up very tightly into these chromosomes, which makes it easier to move the chromosomes around and pull the chromatids apart during cell division uh, and mitosis and then meiosis. So none of the DNA is left behind. So this is an important thing that chromosomes that happens to DNA is bunching them up on the proteins and then tightening them up into these things we call um, chromosomes. We can identify as chromosomes.